it's my great pleasure to introduce your host for today, Mr. Paul Jensen, Director of Policy and Strategy at the Union. Paul, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone participating in today's Union webinar. Today, we will hear two competing perspectives on one of the most timely and one of the most important matters of debate in our collective effort to NTB. My name is Paul Jensen, and it's my pleasure to kick off today's webinar. I will do that by first briefly introducing the debate topic before I go ahead and welcome our speakers. So first, framing the topic. Today, the TB drug pipeline is the strongest it's been for at least the last decade. Numerous clinical trials are currently underway that are testing new medicines, as well as new combinations of medicines to be used for the treatment of TB. And this raises an important question when we look to the near future. Does today's R&D pipeline call for a change in the current approach to the management of drug-resistant TB? The current approach is one where different standardized treatment regimens are prescribed based on the status of the patient and based on the resistance profile of the bacilli that are making the patient sick. If the patient has never had TB before, he or she receives a certain treatment regimen which is different from the treatment regimen used when someone has already been treated for TB in the past. The goal is to provide a treatment regimen according to the patient's resistance profile while working to control the development of new resistance. We will refer to this approach, the current approach, as the cascade approach. The question is, does an invigorated TB drug pipeline call for moving away from the cascade approach to a new approach where patients receiving care for drug-resistant TB receive the strongest available treatment regimen that is made up of new TB medicines? And should they receive that new regimen the first time they're treated? Both of our speakers bring a wealth of understanding and experience to today's debate topic. Arnaud Tribuke is a medical doctor who has been working for the union since 1992. As the former head of the union's TB department, he has supported national tuberculosis programs in many low and middle income countries, advising governments on TB. He's organized international courses on many aspects of TB, including MDR TB and child TB. And he's launched several research efforts. The most recent one was on short course treatment for MDR TB that was carried out across nine French speaking countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. He's published more than 80 articles in peer reviewed scientific journals. Grania Brigden is a medical doctor and the deputy director of the union's department of TB and HIV. And in this role, she's involved in developing relationships to expand the union's work programs for TB, HIV, and comorbidities, and for the strategic directions of the TB HIV department. Grania leads the union's work as the secretariat for the Life Prize, a new model of research and development for TB. Grania studied medicine at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland and continues to work in an ad hoc basis for the National Health Service as an honorary consultant at the Royal Free Hospital, London. She's based in Geneva, Switzerland, and is head of the union's Geneva office. So the way that today's webinar will work is each speaker will have about 15 minutes to present a competing perspective on the issue. And then we'll open the discussion to questions from all of you, the participants. And with that, I welcome our first speaker, Arnaud Tribuke. Thank you, Paul. So I speak about the cascade of a regimen. If it works. Yes, cascade of regimens. I'd like first to go for uh, some uh, statements about the basic TB control principles that are admitted worldwide. I took them from the International Standards for Tuberculosis Care, which were published in the Lancet in 2006 and are still uh, very pertinent. Um, first, all providers who undertake evaluation and treatment of patients with tuberculosis must recognize that not only are they delivering care to an individual, but they are also assuming an important public health function. I think there is always this notion of public health, which is very important when we speak about tuberculosis control. And also all providers who 
treat a patient with tuberculosis must have the knowledge to prescribe a standard treatment regimen of proven efficacy. A standard treatment regimen of proven efficacy. I think that is very, very important. The main reason for standardized regimen is to avoid prescription errors, to facilitate the drug supply, and to increase the success rate, which is the objective of every treatment and even of every diagnosis of a TB patient. And in fact, every country recommends standardized treatment for rifampicin sensitive tuberculosis. But what about standardized treatments for rifampicin resistant tuberculosis and ultra resistant tuberculosis or XDRTB? Rifampicin resistant tuberculosis is RRTB. And in fact, until 2010, there was no regimen of proven efficacy for this kind of tuberculosis. But now we have a standardized regimen of proven efficacy for this kind of tuberculosis. It is what we call usually the Bangladesh regimen, which is a nine month treatment where you give for nine months gatifloxacin, clofazimine, ethambutol, pyrazinamide, supplemented by, by um, oh, PTO and uh, isoniazid high dose and uh, canamycin and for the first for the first four months. So we have this standardized regimen of proven efficacy. We know it's effic this efficacy because of the observational studies published from Bangladesh in 2010, in Niger in 2014, from Cameroon in 2015, and the nine African country study run by the Union in 2018. This year also we have at The Hague, the last Union conference, the results, the final results of the randomized clinical trial stream, which shows no inferiority of this short course regimen compared to the WHO recommended regimen of 20 months. Just to remind that already in 2010, the union published a guide in this guideline, management of tuberculosis, a guide to the essentials of good practice. The, this guide recommended the nine month regimen for rifampicin resistant tuberculosis. And now also we have the WHO recommendations published in 2016 and in 2018 recommending this standard short course regimen for RRTB. What about XDRTB? Much more complex. We have only case reports, no observational studies, no randomized clinical trial. Again, some basic facts for tuberculosis control. Experience shows that at the population level, drug resistance emerged with increased and widespread use of a given drug. We know that since the very beginning of the antibiotic therapy for tuberculosis. Even Crofton in uh, the late 40s showed that using streptomycin, which was the only drug at this time, among the patients who failed treatment, resistance to streptomycin was very, very high. So we know that. And we know that for the three main drugs which are uh, available right now, which is isoniazid, rifampicin, and fluoroquinolone, as they were sequentially introduced into re re routine treatment, the most common type of drug resistance is to INH because it was used this much more long time. Resistance to rifampicin is much less common and resistance to fluoroquinolone is even more rare. 
And even if beta quinine is very new drug, we already know there are some resistance to these drugs. So we know that resistance will arrive. And the construct of a cascade of regimen make use of this knowledge. Regimen proposed in the cascade regimen must provide high effectiveness in each step of the cascade and minimize the frequency of adverse drug effects sufficiently for management to be decentralized. That is absolutely key for the TB treatment. I want to introduce now another concept is the concept of core drug. And I would refer to an article which was uh, proposed also with, with this webinar. It was an article published in 2018 by Van Dun, Van, Van Dun and uh, his colleagues, which was principles for constructing a tuberculosis treatment regimen, the role and definition of core and companion drug. What do we call core drug? The core drug is the drug which in the regimen contributes most to relapse-free cure. It is because of this drug that the patient is cured. He has moderate to high bactericidal activity. He has to have a good sterilizing activity. It has to be given throughout the treatment. It has to be well tolerated. And it has to have no cross resistance with the core drug used in the previous regimen to be used in the, in the cascade regimen. Currently, the core drugs include rifampicin, the fourth generation of fluorquinolones, and also levofloxacin, which is the third generation, and most probably bedaquiline. That's the core drug. But we all know that one drug is not enough to cure tuberculosis. We need companion drugs for these core drugs. These companion drugs are there to avoid failure due to acquired drug resistance against the core drug. Some of these companion drugs can also help to reduce the risk of relapse and can shorten the regimen. But that's companion drug, that's not a core drug. And they are essential. The cascade of treatment regimen, which is proposed, which is used in, in a lot of countries, you have first line treatment for patients who have no history of prior anti-tuberculosis treatment lasting for as much as one month. It is the usual six month standard regimen based on first line drugs, and it's six months of rifampicin isoniazid supplemented the two first months by uh, perazinamide and ethambutol. Very amazingly, would say, but that this first line treatment is used all over the world. In high income countries, like in low income countries, it is the same standardized first line regimen, which is used everywhere. The second line treatment is for patients with prior anti-TB treatment, which are usually relapse failures return after default, based on microscopic criteria, sometimes new cases also, but all these TB cases must have a proven resistance to rifampicin. So, patients with tuberculosis resistant to rifampicin. And the core drugs there is the gatifloxacin, which could be replaced by moxifloxacin or levofloxacin, very high dose. So it is the Bangladesh regimen, nine months, with the fluoroquinolone, the clofazimine, the ethambutol, the pyrazinamide, 
and supplemented the four first months by protonamide, isoniazid high dosage, and clop and uh, and, uh, and 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 canamycin. Canamycin can be replaced also by amikacin. So that's a second line treatment for the cascade. And when you have a bacilli which is resistant to gatifloxacin, well, that means to a fluoroquinolone of third or fourth generation, and to rifampicin, we have tests now to be able to recognize the resistance to fluoroquinolones. We could use the bedaquiline for this third line treatment. Bedaquiline as a core drug. Which companion drugs with bedaquiline? That is not, not yet now. Not yet proved efficacious regimen. And it will depend on the history of the patient, what drug he took, and what are the results of the DST. But the third line treatment is the central drug would be the bedaquiline. In resume, in resume, the public health perspective is fundamental. It's not good to go for individualized care. It's that never been good for tuberculosis control. Treatments must be standardized as much as possible. For rifampicin resistant tuberculosis with no fluoroquinolone or second line injectable resistance, the only regimen of proven efficacy is the nine month so-called Bangladesh regimen. I think that is very important. We hear a lot of different regimens going around and uh, we hope we have a new one will be shorter and easier and all with all that we can expect. But we have to really understand that the only regimen of proven efficacy is the nine month Bangladesh regimen. One core drug per regimen is key, and only one. We don't need to have two core drugs in the same regimen. But of course, the core drugs must be accompanied by other drugs in a standardized regimen as much as possible. Resistance to new drugs will develop. We know that. And we know that already, as said before, there is some resistance to beta -quilin. And that is the normal life. And there is also some resistance even to delamanine. And we think that the cascade regimen is most probably the best way to delay the development of resistance to new drugs. I think it's probably impossible to avoid development of resistance. Problem is to slow down the path to have new drugs to replace those who have failed to be active. Thank you very much for your attention. And I will give the, the microphone to Rania Bridgen for her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Arno. Um, Okay, so I am now going to like to discuss with you all today how we can move from the cascade approach to the uh, best regimen first approach. So a pan DRTB or RIF resistant TB regimen. And I will be doing this by outlining of what, what, of what is an ideal RIF resistant TB regimen and what the impact of this regimen could be and why we are at the stage that, that we can already start to implement th this approach now. So what is, uh, oh, sorry, I'm just trying to see if I can get my slides to work. Um, can anyone flip my slides on? Doesn't, okay, thank you. So, what is the ideal RIF resistant TB regimen? And this question has already been answered for us. So, in 2016, the WHO 
set up a process to talk about what would be the, the TB regimens of the future and what the target regimen profiles for a RIF sensitive TB regimen would be, a RIF resistant TB regimen and a pan TB regimen looking a little bit further into the future. And so for the RIF resistant TB regimen, I think the what it could be are four or fewer effective drugs from different classes that can be used for all patients, so children and adults, be affordable and available in low and middle income countries, be a type of regimen that could be prescribed in all settings where TB occurs, to move away from injectable agents and have a simple dosing schedule, to be of a duration of nine months or less, and to work for extra pulmonary TB as well, and to include drugs that um, are suitable for the context where we treat TB. As well as these characteristics within this process, there was an awareness of that, particularly for RIF resistant TB, but actually for TB more generally, this is an infection that has a tendency, a well-known, tendency to develop resistance to antibiotics that are used to, to treat it. So in addition to these more programmatic criteria, there were additional criteria within the target regimen profile looking at the regimen's barrier to developing resistance and ensuring that the adherence it is a forgiving regimen when it comes to adherence risks. And another critical assumption within this was that future regimens should contain drugs with a clear sterilizing effect and enable a non-relapsing cure. So as part of this target regimen profile, I think it's important to know, well, why do we want a better RIF resistant TB regimen? And looking, and there was mathematical modeling done to look at what the potential impact of, of a perfect or a better RIF resistant TB regimen could be. And following on from Arnaud's comments, this sort of having a look at what this population wide impact of a better, uh, uh, and I would say perfect, RIF resistant TB regimen can be, looking at incident and more mortality. And what did this, well, what did this modeling show? And basically it showed that efficacy has the greatest impact on a population based impact. So if we were improve the efficacy, from a 76% in drug resistant TB, and I think that was even quite um, a quite a high um, uh, base level to if we had a RIF resistant TB regimen that had similar uh, efficacy to the current drug sensitive TB, then we would have the greatest impact particularly on mortality, transmission, and re re reducing the burden of disease. So this model looked at the reduction in mortality in an Indian-like setting 10 years after the introduction of the optimal RIF resistant TB regimen. So what it shows was that a, a strong or optimal RIF resistant TB regimen could reduce the RIF resistant TB incidence by 32% and the mortality by 30% within 10 years of introduction. So we know that we we know what we want. We know we can get to see what the impact of that perfect or strong RIF resistant TB regimen could be. But is it realistic? And I think as Paul pointed out, we the drug pipeline is the best that it has been for many, many years. And if we look at it, we have a number of different classes of drugs, which is a key part, part of building the regimens of the future. And not only do we have many new classes of drugs or hopeful improvements of existing classes of drugs, but these 
drugs are all being developed from phase two onward as a part of a regimen-based approach. So we are, we do have the tools to de develop the RIF resistant TB regimens or the best TB RIF resistant TB regimens in the future. But I would additionally argue that actually we have the tools now to really make our first pan TB RIF resistant TB regimen and start to see the population wide impacts outlined in the in the previous slides. So this is having a look at some of the work that Eric Nuremberger has been doing on what the sort of best regimens for DRTB could be. And if you look, and I've highlighted in yellow, these are drugs that are currently available for procurement now. So we have bedaquilin, the role of bedaquilin, pyrazidinamide, and either delaminid or moxifloxacin or an oxidolidinone class, and the main one we're using now is lizidididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididididid
And so there has been uh, by Emily Kendall um, and the David Dowdy's group and John Hopkins looking at what are what is the cost effectiveness of this um, very effective uh, pan riff resistant TB approach. How much could we um, could be spent on the drug? costs on it or make it budget neutral for programs to implement. And so this is looking at introducing this pan TB, pan RIF resistant TB regimen into a high burden setting with the optimized characteristics that I've already highlighted. And what this shows, and it looked at the total health system cost, and it showed that they that the optimal uh, pan pan riff resistant TB regimen could be made available even at a cost of five thousand dollars per treatment and still be budget neutral for programs because of the 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 programmatic savings that would be made with a considerably shorter, less toxic, more effective. Um, treatment for drug resistant TB. Additionally, this is not taking into account some of the uh, additional cost savings or cost uh, um, implications of having a pan TB, a pan DRTB regimen. So if we are looking at a standard three to four drug regimen that works for all patients with drug resistant TB, we also start to bring in a lot of the market dynamics work where we are consolidating the market and allowing for economies of scales to also drive down the drive down the price of this future regimen that I am arguing we have to do today. But we have as I've hopefully shown to you, the tools and the regimens we need to be able to implement a strong RIF resistant TB regimen that works for all. Um, but I would argue we can actually make it, even improve it on what we've got. Um, and how can we take um, previous experience from treating TB and our TB short shortening trials to see if we can further increase the efficacy of the regimen and personalize the regimen in a programmatically friendly way. And so I would like to introduce to you some work that has been done by um, uh, University of San Francisco following on the work of Radha Savic and team for the TB Reflect. And for those of you who do not, TB Reflect was a meta-analysis of all the floral quinolone containing regimen trials for the treatment of DSTB. So it took all the data from the Remox trial, the Oflatub trial, and the Rifocrine trials, which all looked at shortening the treatment for drug-sensitive TB. And so this is greater than 3,500 patients. And by looking, pooling that data and looking through it, it showed that actually the majority of patients could be treated with a shorter duration of treatment, but that there were a core hard to treat population that, that needed longer to treat. So with this data and pulling out the trends from uh, these three trials, it was a, we, that group has been able to pull out sort of uh, key points or key areas that can dictate which patients may require longer or a slightly stronger regimen. And by using this, building it into what's called a stratified, uh, stratified uh, approach. So this is an individualized, personalized uh, regimen, but it's l l looking at how can we ensure that we offer the best treatment to everyone uh, and uh, factor in some of the um, areas that may mean that they need a stronger or longer treatment. And it uses variables that are programmatically uh, able to be implemented, such as smear results um, and uh, HIV status, CD4 count, 
BMI. It also uses ones that may not be routinely available, but I would argue we would hope to make them routinely available in the future, such as cavity present on chest X-ray um, and cultural results. And with this approach, which I think shows the benefit of sharing data from trials, even though they may not have been entirely successful themselves, I argue that, the, that we can further improve the um, pan resistant TB regimen approach by looking at stratifying patients into various groups such that we can ensure that they get the best possible treatment with the highest likelihood of cure. And this is just outlining the approach that the Cure TB um, group are working on, on looking at having a between four to nine month treatment for anyone with RIF resistant TB. So, um, so um, I think uh, I'd like, so in summary, I think a pan RIF resistant TB approach or one RIF resistant regimen for them all is possible now and should be the approach, the future approach to RIF resistant TB care with further advances in drug and regimen development in, in the R&D pipeline as well as stratified approaches allowing us to continue to offer the best regimen for all patients with RIF resistant TB. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brigden, and also to Dr. Trebuk. Um, we are now going to begin answering the questions that have been submitted, and we're getting so many in. Um, as a reminder, you can still submit your questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Any questions that we are unable to get to today, we will be forwarding on to our presenters after the webinar, so we will be able to follow up with you. Um, firstly, before we go into the questions, um, we've got a couple of comments that um, I wonder if um, Arnold and um, Grania, you could, uh, could comment on. Um, the comment is, BDQ is superior to injectables in terms of safety and efficacy in treatment of um, RRMDRTB, the latest WHO rapid communication and meta analysis. Analysis, sorry, analysis of the individual patient data um, in MDRTB treatment 2017. Do you have a comment on that, either of you? Yes, I can comment on that. Thank you, you Arnold. Me? Please do. Yes, we do, Arnold. Please do go ahead. Yes. We have a big hope in a oral regimen. I think it's a good thing if we could go to oral regimen. But so far, we don't have any proof of a total oral regimen which is equivalent or superior of to the nine-month regimen. Second, and, and that is very important, I think to know that we have a new drug, which is a good drug with the characteristics of a core drug is very good and very important. But I don't, I'm not convinced that it should be used for rifampicin resistance tuberculosis when there is no resistance to fluoroquinone. One core drug is enough, and with a Bangladesh regimen, you can cure more than 80% of your patients only with the Bangladesh regimen. So you don't need to add another drug to this regimen. Um, I would just like to say that I think that comment has picked up on the core point of today's conversation. So. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to our um, first actual question rather than a comment. Um, the question is, the previous standard regime of eight months promoted drug resistance, as did the standard category four regime. And the standard six month regime is now promoting 
um, RIF resistance due to the prevalence of INH resistance among previously untreated patients. The standard regimes recommended all appear one step after the process of bacterial resistance. What is planned for the standard first line regime changes now in order to stop producing RIF resistant relapses? Sorry, all of your questions are going to be very, very long today, so please do, I do apologise. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I think maybe I th the uh, I think how we have developed TB drugs till uh, up until now has been um, where we have developed a drug, um, not a regimen, despite knowing the fact that TB needs to be treated by a combination of drugs rather than one drug. And this um, approach has 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 helped generate the resistance. So I think. The and I welcome the approach now by regulators and drug developers to develop new drugs as part of regimens because I think that will go a long way in in ensuring that we are introducing new drugs in a way that reduces our chances of them developing resistance. Um, and so, and with regards to going forward with the drug sensitive. Um, TB. I think if we continue to have a a good drug pipeline where we are getting number of new classes of drugs, we can move from a pan pan riff resistant TB um, approach to a pan TB approach where we. But but this because of the effectiveness of the current first line regimen this will take a bit longer compared to a pan resistant tb regimen approach thank you very much grania and moving on to our next question um what is the evidence to support a single core drug plus companion drugs how do we know that's as good as or even better than one core drugs in a regime? I'm not sure I answered correctly the question. You, you say one core drug alone or uh, against one core drug with companion drugs? Yes, correct. So what is the evidence to support a single core drug with companion drugs? Um, and how do we know that that's as good as one core drug in a regime? Well, we know that in tuberculosis, in the population of bacilli, there are always some mutations and you have some bacilli which are resistant to the drug. And we know since the beginning, since ever, that we do studies on that, that we will, by using only one drug, we will select some resistance. Basically, that's why we need companion drugs, and we need even when it, the tuberculosis bacilli is sensitive at the beginning in the population of uh, the patient in the of the bacilli of the patient, there are some which are muted and begin to be resistant. So even if they are sensitive at the beginning, you will have some resistance. That's why you need the companion drugs. The core drugs will do. 90% of the work or 95% of the work, but the other drugs are there to protect the development of resistance to the core drug. So you need companion drugs and you will always need some companion drugs. Thank you very much, um, Arnold. And we do have another question for you. Um, while we don't have a direct comparison between, um, bet bet uh, yeah, I can't pronounce it, betelkin based all oral regimes and the nine to 12 month regime, we do have data from RSA that says you are three times less likely to die if you receive BDQ. The same can't be said for the nine to 12 month regime. You need, you need to do some, uh, uh, good uh, observational study or to do some randomized clinical trial. You cannot say that right now like that. 
from the what was published from South Africa, you had, I don't remember, something like 30% of the patients who had not finished their treatment yet. So you, you can have less, less people who die at the moment and more a bit later. You have to use what we developed in the typical disease control since ever, is the cohort study. You take some patients under a treatment and you look when the treatment is finished or even a bit later to measure the relapses, what happened to these patients will begin. We don't have this, this data. We still don't have this data. When, if we have such data, that would be interesting, but you have to compare and you have to study things very carefully, and we don't have that yet. Thank you very much, Arnold. Um, and another question for you, please. Um, from your point of view, it uh, appears that you are highly recommending the Bangladesh STR regime. Does this mean that an all oral longer regime proposed in the recent WHO rapid communication is not good enough? My, my son back. Yeah. You know that uh, we know since ever also that when you have to treat a patient for 20 months, a lot of them stop before the end of the, of the treatment. That is the reality. We know that we had 50% cure rate with a 20 month regimen published in a lot of, lot of papers. When you do a clinical trial, as that was done with STREAM, you make a lot of pressure on the, on the patients and you have much less loss for follow up. You still have much more loss for follow-up than with nine months. And that was the same with the sensitive TB when we were treated, treating the TB for 18 months. When the six months treatment arrived, that was much, much better. So there is no, no, no doubt that as short is the treatment with a good efficacy as it's better for the, for the patient to follow that. And the problem of injections, okay, we had not, not so long ago, it was recommended to give eight months to 12 months injections. That was a lot, very difficult for the patients. Now with the Bangladesh regimen, we recommend four months only. I don't say it's perfect. It's better to have a totally oral treatment. I fully agree on that, but we still have no evidence that we can do that with good results. There is still no evidence of that. And also another point perhaps, when you know that you have problems with, not, especially the hearing problems with the injectables, you can solve this problem. We have a lot of experience now in the countries where we work, where we pay attention, a lot of attention to that and we decrease the number of uh, adverse events a lot, a lot. And I think it's, it's quality of care is very important. I don't understand that we still treat patients with injectables also without making any measurement of the hearing, uh, of the quality of the hearing of the patient. We have to have audiometer in this center as we need to have electrocardiograph in these centers. It's not it doesn't cost much, and we can manage. Thank and you I think I'd maybe much. just like to add on to Arno's point that also in the WHO guideline, it did um, highlight the importance of doing operational research into looking at replacing the injectable in the short course regimen. And I think, as Arno has pointed out, that this that, that this is uh, another. This could be a key area where we develop the cohorts and look for the evidence to show um, how we can do a shorter all oral regimen using the, the short course regimen as a starting point, but removing the injectable. Yes, absolutely. You have to do, to do research. That's always very important. But research. Thank you very much. Moving on to our next question. Um, if cost were not an issue, 
would pan-TB regime be advisable strictly from the medical perspective? So I think um, the pan-TB for all forms of TB, um, the cost is actually not an issue there. I think it is that actually the the RIF, the RIF sensitive regimen that, that we have actually performs very well. So it is a lot, it'll take a lot longer to have the trials to show the evidence for a better <laughs> regimen to have a entirely pan TB approach. Um, whereas I think, it, and I don't think cost should be an issue even for the RIF resistant stronger regimen, um, because there are costs as the work I showed that it is actually cost effective, particularly for RIF resistant TB and that there could be a short term increase in price that would still be budget neutral for programs. I think the other really important point to bring home about the any of pan TB or uh, any new regimen approach for TB is that this is not moving away from having the accompanying diagnostics to go along with any new regimen to ensure that we can pick up any resistance that may be occurring early and make sure that we adapt the regimen accordingly. Thank you very much, Grania. And um, our next question here, the cascade approach does not offer any evidence for the effectiveness of the third line treatment with or without exposure to the proposed second line treatment. So on what grounds can cascade proponents argue that the cascade has the greatest public health impact? Is there similar modeling? to that performed on the PAN-RR regime to support this assertion? Grania or Arnold, are you able to take that question? I can't. I don't know, Grania, if you can answer that. Um, I'm not aware of any of the modelling work done for the Cascade approach, so... Um... I'm not able to answer that one, unfortunately. Just a comment from the, from the cascade approach. When you have uh, a cure rate which is satisfying with a regimen, uh, it's okay. The, the problem is to offer to the patient the best regimen he can he can have. So if you if you go from one to the other according to the cascade. Uh, approach, you give each time the best regimen to the patient. That's why. Thank you very much. Um, and a question here, and um, please do, um, I apologize for my pronunciation. Um, could you share your experience of using bedequilin and delaminid in children? Um, so, I think uh, there has been work, in, well, there is studies underway um, for both delaminid and bedaquilin in children. The delaminid, or the Otsuka compound, is, has data on uh, the PK and the doses required from age two and above, and I think the age two and under data is coming out very soon um, and the bedaquilin data is a bit further behind that. Um, with regards to programmatic experience of using these drugs, um, the numbers are small um, and I'm aware of some groups particularly in South Africa and MSF and PIH who have been using both delaminid and bedaquilin in uh, adolescents and children with um, good effect, but obviously these are not part of trials and these are small cohorts. So there is experience, but not large amounts. And currently there does not look like to be any major safety concerns. 
and in fact um, with the data that's available on delaminid um, and the fact that children with MDRTB tend to do very well on treatment there is definitely an argument to have used delaminid and potentially bedaquilin but the data isn't so clear there um, for uh, an injectable free treatment for MDRTB. Oh, no, I'm not sure if you want to add anything further. No, thank you, Nograña. I, I fully agree with you. And I think it's very important to try to document as much as possible. The numbers are small. It's very difficult to have a long, uh, uh, a, a good cohort of patients on that. And I think it's important to document as much as we can what's happening with the children with the different regimens. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Um, next question, what about the interim results from NICS TB? This showed that a simplified, shortened, all oral regime for drug-resistant TB continued to be encouraging in terms of both efficacy and safety. 89% of participants showed a favorable outcome. So yes, I mean, I think this is and what I was bringing up that this is very encouraging because the work that has been done by John Hopkins in mice about what could be the sort of core backbone or the strong reg TB regimens of the future did in fact have the combination that is currently in the NICS regimen, so bedaquil and protominid and lizinacid. So it is very encouraging that the early results from the NICS regimen um, confirmed what has been shown in mice. So I think that does show that there is real potential for having shorter, very effective uh, safe and tolerable regimens or regimen for resistant TB treatment of the future. So I look forward to uh, further work on the role of this combination of drugs as well as the results of some of the MDR trials that are currently underway. I would just add perhaps that a uh, Re research is very important. There is no doubt about that. But interim results, that's not enough. We need to have the final results before to say something strong. Thank you very much. And our next question, would the availability of a real-time treatment response monitoring tool reduce the concern of drug resistant development to new drugs and the spread of such resistance? Such a tool is lacking for TB versus other infectious diseases such as HIV and HCV. Absolutely, and I think this is the core challenge that we don't have a biomarker or any way of showing um, while patients are on treatment, how effective their treatment is apart from, you know, culture or other molecular diagnostic tests. So this is absolutely key um, to further in improving um, our approach to TB care. Um, and I think just really highlights the importance of investing in R&D. And it's not just in R&D for um TB treatments, but also the diagnostic tools as, as well. Thank you very much, Grenya. And um, keeping an eye on time, we will just take another couple of uh, questions here. Um, our next question from your audience, the majority of DRTB is still in poor resource settings and a cost-effective all oral shortened regime of high efficacy needs to be the focus for the future efforts. Instead of defaulting to one core drug approach with a lot of a toxic companion drugs, why not rather focus on three core drugs, i.e. NICs, um, and then feeling free to add FQs if sensitivity is shown? I don't know. Do you, do you think that, uh, I don't know, for the person who asked this question, 
would you would you propose for the uh, all the patients with drug sensitive drug sensitive to rifampicin uh, to add uh, systematically fluoroquinolone and beta quinine to the treatment? The problem is when the treatment fail for any reason, you have to offer to the patient another solution. If you put everything in the same basket, you will n offer nothing for the if there is a problem. I would just um, so I think that I I would this is my core of my argument is I think that is potentially where should, where we should be going in the future and I think the cascade approach was very appropriate when we had a very empty pipeline but I think we have new classes of drugs coming in so this is something that we really need to think about um, as to is this the approach that we would go for. I think it's an important point, and uh, it is uh, the, the, w when you look at the at the past, for 50 years there was no new, new drugs for tuberculosis. 50 years without any new drug. Uh, now there is a pipeline with new drugs. What will be the the output of the pipeline? We still don't know. They are still in the pipeline. World will change, perhaps. Perhaps we we'll probably have to to treat tuberculosis still for long months and we probably will never succeed to treat tuberculosis in one week or something like that but we can hope that there will be some new drugs in the future but so far we are not we they are under development i hope a lot of them will work but we still don't know Thank you very much. And that is all of the time that we do have for questions today. So if I could just hand back to you, Paul, for your closing remarks before we wrap up today's webinar. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone who's participated in the webinar today. We had more than 400 people register for the debate today, which I think goes to show just how critical this issue is. And I want to thank Arno and Grania for really just presenting a, an informed and, and quality debate, different perspectives on the issue. We we did have some questions. Um, unfortunately, because of time, we were not able to get to, but we do have a record of those and we will follow up with responses to the folks who asked those questions. And then finally, if you would like to receive advanced announcements of webinars and, and debates like the one that we just had today, then I encourage you to become a union member. And you can do that by going to the website, union.org or by simply emailing our membership team and their email address is membership at the union.org and with that i want to say thank you again to everyone and i wish you a wonderful rest of your week thank you very much paul and i'd like to add my thanks for everyone attending today and the wonderful questions that we've received once you leave today's webinar you will receive a quick survey on the presentation it's just a couple of really quick questions, so we would be grateful if you could keep your browser window open and complete that and provide your feedback for us. We have had lots of questions. We will be sharing a recording of today's webinar, and that will be in a follow-up email, which will be with you within 24 to 48 hours. On behalf of the union and our presenters, thank you so much for joining us, and please do enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.